Hi, I'm Jason Klepa, and welcome to another episode of the Amrit Mentality Podcast, a show where we interview interesting people, but they make the most out of every single minute. On today's episode is Shane Dorian, big wave surfing legend, father of two, and all around great guy. We had an amazing conversation, primarily about mindset, about how did he start off competing professionally in surfing? What were the dynamics like at a very young age, and how did he come up? And then how is it like to make the decision to shift out of that and to go into big wave surfing? And when you're in big wave surfing, what is it like to paddle in on a 70, 80 foot wave? And how do you develop the mindset and the comfort level to even be able to attempt it? I truly enjoyed this episode. I got a lot of takeaways for my life and I hope you do as well. As always, I hope you have a great day. If you could please subscribe, rate and review, would really appreciate it. Let's go. Okay, so Shane, here we are at uh, what is, Pipe Masters 2018. We're at the Billabong House. Yep, that's right. Um, thanks for taking the time today. I really, really appreciate it. I think um, our audience is going to get a lot from you. When I think about a guy who embraces the AMRAP mentality, like this idea of like being present and focused on a workout or being present and focused on whatever they're doing, I think about you and I'm like, I can't think of too many people who could be more present, more focused than a guy who drops in on a you know 80-foot wave you know, what does it take from a mindset perspective to do that? And then also at the same time, you're married, right? Yeah. You have two kids. I do. And, you know, what is that, what is that all like? And so I was super intrigued to sit down today and I'd like to dive into uh, three different areas. One is business, which in your case is surfing, which is exceptional. I'd love to talk about your surf career, transitioning out of surfing and, uh, excuse me, transitioning out of competing and then going into big wave surfing and what that was like. Um, then I'd like to talk a little bit about um, your family and how competing has been with your wife and how getting your son into surfing and your daughter, what that's like and what is it like to be out there with them? Cause I imagine that's really cool. And then finally dive into a little bit about fitness. I, I, and how that plays a role in surfing, whether now or 10 years ago or when you, you know, when you were competing at the highest level. Sounds good. Cool. So I guess I'll start here. You competed professionally on the circuit for a lot of years, starting when you were like 10, 12 years old. Yeah. Well, it, well it's, not professionally. You started competing at a young age, right? I did. Yeah. So I, I started in amateur surfing competitions at about 10 years old and, and, you know, sort of worked my way up 10, 10 years old, 12 years old, started competing, um, nationally on, in the U S championships every year. And then, and then every two years on the world level, it was like world amateur serving championships. And then, um, yeah, so I, I had a, a pretty, I pr- had a pretty average, um, amateur career. And then once I graduated high school, then I, I qualified to the, for the world tour and in surfing there's, it's similar to, to golf where there's like, you know, different stops, different locations all around the world. And at the end of the year, there's a world champion. So I, I did a world tour for 12 years. 12 years? Yeah, 12 years. And that years. was starting when you were in high school? Uh, right when I graduated high school. Oh. I, I competed for a whole year to qualify to make it to like the big show, which is the, which is the, 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 the CT, which is the, the championship tour. So as you were growing up and you're going through high school, I imagine, well, I mean, you grew up in Hawaii. You grew up in Kona, right? Yeah. And so I imagine a lot of the kids were surfing, but you were probably surfing at the highest level compared to most of them. But what was it like being in school and doing a sport that wasn't your traditional uh, athletics that maybe the school was offering or, or did they offer something in surfing? Because in California, they don't, but maybe in Hawaii, they do. No, yeah, they don't. It's definitely, um, it's a strange sport. You know, it's, it's definitely like a, it's an individual sport where, um, you know, in Hawaii, it was like, it was a very natural thing. You know, when you get out of school, you go to, you go out on the beach, you go surf, all your buddies are there at your home break. Um, it was just something I really fell in love with. I was super passionate about. It's all I thought about. I'd be in school in math class or in science class. And I'd just be thinking about what the waves were like and w- what I was going to do after school and go surfing. And, um, yeah, I, I didn't, it, the schools didn't really support it. There wasn't a surf team. And in fact, my, my, a lot of my teachers really didn't understand. Once I got serious about surfing in high school, my, my teachers really didn't understand it. It wasn't like a, like a, a career path that was in place. It wasn't something like where they were like, Oh, you want to surf. So, okay, let's support this kid. Right. He's traveling. Let's give him his work to, you know, to, to be able to do his work while he's away for events. It was like, what are you doing? What, what they did? There was, there was a real lack of understanding 
So when you graduated from high school and you were making the decision to either, I imagine, go into some other career path, go to college, or pursue surfing, I met, were those the different avenues you yes. could have gone? Yeah. What made you decide, and did you get backlash from your family? How, how did that look when you made the decision, hey, I'm going to commit to surfing, I'm going to go full-time? How did you know that was the right decision to make? And, and what did the family think of that? I mean, because that's not a typical yeah. thing, right? Yeah, it's a very non-typical uh, thing, and it's, it's a really strange career path. And um, my family understood. I was really close. My mom was really supportive. She really supported me throughout my amateur surfing career. She was always driving me to contests, waking up early in the dark and driving me across the island or trying to do fundraisers and, like, raise money. So we, I didn't have enough, uh, very much money. So my, my family had very little. So we did, like, fundraisers to get me to go to, like, World Amateur Championships or the Nationals every year. And so my family was actually really supportive, but it was, I didn't really know what the hell I was doing as far as like pursuing it as a job and pursuing it as a career. And for me, I just wanted to do something where I could surf as much as I possibly could. And so for that, I, I, I looked up to people who were, who at the time, like in the late eighties, early nineties, that was like just the very start of people making money in surfing, just the very start of real professional surfing. So, um, it was uh, it was a relatively new thing, and for me, it was like it it wasn't a no brainer situation. I wasn't like the the highest level amateur. I wasn't like the kid that everyone thought was going to become a pro surfer. I really had to. It was it was a, a really hard battle at the start. Um, I really had to work my butt off and um, really sacrifice a ton and try and learn a whole lot. And um, it was a real leap of faith. It was one of those situations where I was like, screw it, I'm going to give this thing everything I have. And, and, if, and if I don't have what it takes, at, at, at least I know I really tried. So what did those first few years look like? You know, you talk about making sacrifices and leap, leap of faith. And I think anybody who's reached high level success in anything really on the surface, many people don't see the background. I mean, were you getting up early, going out surfing? Were you pursuing a, a group of friends to raise you all up together? I mean, what did that? What were the first couple of years like when you graduated from high school and transitioned into this kind of professional career path as being a surfer? Yeah, the the uh, the day after I graduated high school, my stuff was already packed. I moved to California, slept on my buddy's couch. Um, I had no money, but that's where, um, a lot of the contests were going down a lot of comp competitions. So I spent about four months in California and just grinded it out. Just, just went from competition to competition to competition and learned as much as I possibly could. And then, um, soon after that, I got a couple sponsors and started very, very slow, um, where I wasn't making hardly any money, just enough to barely survive. And then it just started like, um, I started gaining speed and, but, you know, I definitely wasn't an overnight success. It was a situation where I had to really bust my butt and, and um, um, just kind of slowly work my way up. And so as you're working your way up, what were the kind of the highlights of your professional surfing career on, the, on, on that realm? And then we could talk about the, the big wave surfing. But if you segmented them out, if you were to talk about your career path or your surfing from being in all these different competitions, you're busting your butt, you're getting sponsors, you're putting in the work. What were some highlights in your competitive career there? Well, yeah. First of all, I barely qualified. I was like one of the last guys to qualify for the world tour when I was like 19 years old. And so I, as I was very, very, I was just like, I just squeaked in. And, and then that first year I basically got my butt kicked. Um, it was like a super steep learning curve. I didn't do very good in competitions. And, and so it was very, very slow. It was very humbling. And I really had to go back to square one and just bust my butt and get back on the tour again, which I did that same year. But um, it was a slow progression and a slow ascension. And, but like a few years later, I started doing really good. And I got from like, I was like in the, in the 30s and I got in the, in the 20s in the ratings. Yeah. And then I broke into the top 10. And then next thing I know, I was a world title contender. So for a bunch of years, I was finishing in the, in the top 10 and the top five. So um, there was a bunch of years where I was going for the world title, even in the final event. So I, I, was, I, I slowly but surely became like a super high level competitive surfer. So in the beginning, you barely made uh, the tour or the circuit. Yes. Was there a year you didn't make it? No. So once you made it, you made it every year. Yes. And so something I was talking about with Josh Bridges the other day is that Nothing, just because you got it once doesn't mean you're guaranteed it again, right? You got to keep continuously putting in the work. Just because you qualified in 2000 and, you know, 
one doesn't mean you're going to be guaranteed 2002. Is that the same way in surfing where every year you got to earn your stripes every year? You got to be put in the work to stay at the highest level so you can get access to this tour. For sure. It's so easy to get kicked out. It's so easy to not qualify. Um, it's very difficult to stay at that high level for, you know, any length of time. And, um, you know, you're only as good as your, as your last result really. And then the, then the final ratings at the end of the year, if you're one spot out, you're out for the whole year. Wow. You have to put in a whole wow. another year's work just to qualify for the following year. So, so what's that stress like? It's very cutthroat. Yeah. I mean, you're coming out of high school. You're a pretty young guy. You're getting into the, you know, and, and there's sponsorship and money on the line. I mean, what is that like? I mean, uh, w what's the vibe like when you're out on a, on a set and you're about to, you know, you're competing against your buddies? What, what does that look like? Um, sorry. <laughs> sorry. My son is talking oh. to me right in the background. What's He's that? asking me a question. Yes, you can go with him. Thank you. All right. Hi. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, no problem. So what is it like? So you graduate from high school and you have this kind of this stress of competing. Like you said, you could be one, one point off from not even qualifying for the whole competition yeah. for the next year and then you're out, right? Yeah. So what are the vibes like when you're out in the water, in these heats? And then how did you overcome that stress? How did you learn to overcome that? Because you were young when you got into the sport, just like your son, actually, young yeah. getting into the sport how did you learn the mindset to overcome and push through to, cause I imagine it was very stressful. Yeah. I, I think a lot of it just came to like sheer, sheer desire to succeed. I didn't have a backup plan. I didn't have, um, my, I didn't have parents that were like, well, if you don't do it, we'll just send you through college. I, I had no, nothing like that. So it was like, I was either going to make it as a pro surfer or I was going to have to work my way through college being like, a waiter or something literally i didn't know skills and not like high level education so it was like for me i was like i wanted it so bad i wanted to surf for a living so bad that i just i lived and breathed it every single waking moment i was surfing if i wasn't surfing i was thinking about surfing if i wasn't thinking about surfing i was training i was i was trying to get physically and mentally fit and so it, like the mindset my the, the mindset in my competitions, it was like extreme focus. I wanted to tear the other person's head off. Right. And, and that's the only way I was able to succeed. So then w with that mindset, you're out there and the way surfing works, I mean, you obviously know more than me, but I imagine you're in, you're in like a small group, right? And then you kind of yeah. take turns, et cetera, on, on, on waves, but you're kind of out there close to each other. Right. And yeah. so I imagine there could be some crap talking back and forth. And what is the atmosphere like in professional surfing out on the water? Because that's something that most people have no idea about, including myself. Yeah, it's funny because you think of surfers as being like these kind of like – because surfing really isn't – I don't think of it as a sport at all. But there is a sport side of it. And when you're competing, obviously, you're you're right in the heart of the sport of it. But, you know, surfers are known as like these guys who like ditch work to go surf or after school you go surfing and you wake up early to get out there with your board and hang out with your buddies and it's – way more of like a lifestyle right. type of like relaxed environment and everyone's like so like peace vibes and you know getting one with the ocean but in a competition it's just prison rules you're just full on cutthroat mode do anything to win it's very very people are super dead serious about surfing competition um there's a lot on the line with sponsorships with money with with making a living i mean if if you if you're not at the top level you don't you don't make any money so it's you 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 really have to bust your ass so when you're out there, what kind of, can you give us an example of in your, in your career when, when you kind of had to put on the, the cutthroat? Oh, a lot of trash talk, a lot <laughs> of the trash time. talk. Yeah. People. And, and I didn't know what to expect. My first year on the tour, I remember being in a, and like starting to get to know people that were established pros, kind of like the old guard that were already there. And I was like, I had been looking up to these guys for my whole life. They were like my heroes. And I got on tour and I was like, Hey guys, I'm here. And they're just like, like kind of vibing me out, like mind gaming me before I even surfed against them. They, they weren't nice to me. They weren't nice to my crew. I came up with a group of guys who all qualified like in the same couple years. And we were all a bunch of young American guys who had been competing and we, we were a very tight knit crew already, but we were like this new school crew and this old guard that was already established. There was a real pushback. They didn't like us. They didn't want us to succeed. They didn't want to see us doing our thing. We had a totally different type of surfing style, which they kind of disregarded and, and kind of like downplayed that, that we were a real movement. And, and, um, and so it was like this old school versus new school type of dynamic on tour, um, which made it really interesting. But I remember the first couple heats I had with some of that crew, 
they were splashing water at me. They were pulling my leash, which is like the leash on <laughs> yeah, your board. Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, and, and, or like yelling at me, trying to make me fall when I would stand up. And it was like, though, like, the, like the mentality amongst the old crew was like, do anything it takes to win, no matter what it takes. A win's a win, period. And, and in our group, it was more like integrity, like trying to like win on the merit of your ability of surfing, you know? So then your crew that came up, that was like Kelly and yeah. like other guys. Yeah. yeah. So now you're coming up, you're this young breed. How did that transform the way you looked at it later on? Because I imagine then tables turned, right? 15 oh, yeah. years later, yeah. you became kind of like the OG, the, you know, the... For sure. And then did you kind of take guys under your wing and support them? Or did you kind of realize why those guys were the way they were? Yeah, for me, I just become... It's, it's we were the young crew coming up. And then once we were established and we were at the, the highest level, you know, all my friends started winning world titles and winning tons of contests and getting huge sponsorship contracts. And all of a sudden we were with the established group. Right. And for me, I, I was at a high level for a while and I started slowly but surely started getting burnt out on competition. I started realizing it really wasn't what I really wanted to do. My heart stopped being into competition. I started, I started having a really difficult time being inspired and, and being determined and getting psyched for my heats. I would be in, I would be in the middle of a heat and, and, and if I lost the heat or won the heat, I was, had the same exact feeling. I, really? Zero emotion. Um, I didn't care about winning or losing. It didn't matter to me. Um, if I won, great. If I didn't, I could fly home. Um, and that's the, not the sort of vibe that you want to be in as a competitor, you know? Is that when you knew it was time to maybe shift gears? Because, you know, when you're a competitor, you, you know, everybody wants to win. And did you know when it kind of no longer mattered to you how you placed, like you knew something needed to change? Is that what it was? Oh yeah. I felt like I wasn't living up to my potential. Like I wasn't, wasn't firing on all cylinders. And I, I felt like I wasn't doing what I should be doing. Um, I, I, I no longer felt that competition surfing is something I wanted to focus on. And I really always had this passion for big waves, but the, the, the world tour being what it is, it's so involved and it's so time consuming that you have very little time to pursue anything else. So even though I loved surfing big waves, I had very little time to do that. And so I, I ended up wanting to stop surfing on the tour to focus on surfing big waves. Wow. And so you're in the, you're every year you're battling for this spot. You get it, get it, get it, get it, get it. And then was it just like one day you're like, hey, you know what? I'm going to stop being on this tour and I'm going to go. I mean, h how many years did it take you to make that decision? Because I imagine that was not easy. You had sponsorship. At the time, did you have a, uh, at the time you probably were married, but maybe your children were just born. Is that what it no, was? No, my kids weren't born yet. No, your kids weren't no. born yet. So what were the factors that made you just decide and how quickly was that? did that occur? It was a really difficult decision. It, was, it wasn't a difficult decision in my heart. It wasn't there anymore. I didn't like competing. I didn't want to compete on the world tour any longer. There was a new group of, of younger guys coming up who were really insane surfers, like really good. I mean, you, you can only stop the youth for so long, you know? Right. And, and as you, and, and surfing competition, I just, I just felt like, I don't know. I just, it just wasn't right. And, and so, but, but the other side of things was there were, the, there was no precedent for, there, there, there were no guys who had stopped full-time competition who went on to immediate success outside of competition. And in surfing, it's like, you know, I had, a, I had a solid paycheck. I had a lot of sponsors paying me really good money at the time. And so I was sort of walking away and it was a little bit of a leap of faith with this other, there was like a, and, and I had to go to my sponsors and kind of explain to them, look, here's the deal. I want to, I want to stop competing full time. I want to start working on film projects. I want to work, I want to do I, I had to like make a list and make a game plan for exactly what I wanted to do. And there, but there, the problem was there wasn't a precedent. I couldn't like point to someone else and go, Hey, you see what that guy's doing? That's what I want to do. There, yeah. there, there wasn't really that guy there yet. And so I had to be like, Hey, this is my plan. This is what I want to do. And, and to the credit of my sponsors, they were amazing. They, they really had a lot of faith in me and they really backed me. That's all. So your sponsor is back to you. Yes. And you basically pioneered this <laughs> idea of transitioning. And so, when you, I mean, it's really cool. You're like following your passion. You're getting this paycheck. You're saying, you know what? I'm no longer into it over here. I'm really excited about this. And you, you made the leap. I mean, that's pretty cool. Cause a lot of guys could stay in it for a lot longer because they get attracted to the fame or whatever it is. You had no certainty over here. Right. And, yeah. it, and it worked out, but you didn't know that. So let's, let's shift a little bit. I mean, 
why big waves? Because uh, I'm, I'm intimidated enough of a six foot wave, right? Yeah, I can't even imagine what it's like to, to for an eighty foot wave, I, it, or even higher. And so, how did you make that shift? And how did you know it was? Big, did you just have fun? I mean, what what is what drives you to go on big waves? Yeah, the the crazy thing is about big waves. Well, first of all, in small waves and in normal size waves, if you have a, a high level of surfing ability, you can learn to surf 90% of the waves really good. Um, and, you know, you, but with big waves, it doesn't matter how good you are. It, it, if, if you don't have that in your DNA that you absolutely love that challenge and are, you can overcome your fear, then it's not for you. It, there's a lot of surfers that are the highest level of technical ability surfers in the world that want nothing to do when the waves get 50 feet. They, they, they don't want to be out there. They don't want to be anywhere near it. Yeah. Um, it's a totally different beast. And in, unless you can, you know, so for me, I really loved, I always loved surfing big waves. I had a couple of really close friends who were some of the best big wave surfers in the world. Um, and I would surf with them when I was growing up, when I was 16, 17, 18, I moved over here to the North Shore and they took me under their wing and I become, became exposed to big waves and I loved it right away and I felt like I was good at it. I, I, I really did. I felt like I was like really comfortable when the waves got huge, which and is I, unusual. To give reference, at 16, 17, 18 years old, what is a big wave? Like a 40-foot face. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 40-foot face. Like, r relatively speaking, like, so, like uh, pretty much as big as the waves ever get. At that time, I was already, when I was 17 years old, I was surfing really huge waves. So when you were 17, you're, you're hitting up these 40-foot waves, and you're out there, and you're waiting. Cause, so I've, I've paddled out before, and I've been on like five-foot waves. But when you watch it kind of crest over from the opposite side, right, when you're, when you're in the ocean, yeah. I mean, it just looks so big for a five, six-footer. I can only imagine what it looks like when you're on the up, when you're out in the ocean, you're watching these 40 foot waves kind of be created and then come over and go. What does it feel like to be sitting out there and to know you're about to go drop in on one of these guys or paddle in, I should say. <laughs> like, well, it, it's sort of depends, you know, where your mind's at. The, the emotions you go through are like, if you're, if you're ready for it and you are excited about it and you love it and you're embracing it, then the emotions are like just pure excitement and anticipation and you're excited about the challenge. If you're not in the right mindset, it's just pure, sheer terror. And, and you feel like you're going to die. If you, you know, it's, it's, it's terrifying. It really is. Like, um, if you're not on your game, it's, it's just, you just don't want anything to do with it. And so that's the, that's the cool thing about big waves is like yeah. to, to, to try to get into that mindset where you're excited to be, turn around when that giant wave is coming to turn around, put your head down and stroke into that wave. And it's giant. Everything, everything in your body and mind is telling you to get the hell out of there and get nowhere near that. And to be able to overcome that and really commit is, um, that's what's exciting. That's what's a lot of fun. And, um, and that's the thing that kept me coming back for big waves. So you were 16, 17, 18, then you kind of fell off that because you had to you yeah. know, stay focused on. Then when you came back to it, so is the reason why you love big waves, is it because it's this idea. So, for example, um, uh, like ice baths, right? They they're uncomfortable, but they they make you push mentally and physically to kind of get in there and get back out. As an example, is there something about you know paddling in on one of these waves that you embrace the fact that you are confronting discomfort and you're overcoming it? Is that is that part of it? And then when you're when you're doing it, what are you telling yourself? as you're kind of going out to these waves, right? You're hitting a channel maybe and you're coming around. What's, what's your pregame focus? What are, you t what are you telling yourself? I, you know, I don't really know. Um, for, for me, my, my pregame focus is really just like relying on my experience. And um, every single wave I've caught up into this point, every single session I've surfed up into this point, every year I've been surfing up to this point, they all kind of come into this. That's, that's my structure. That's my base. That's my that's that's my platform and and i feel like i should be able to rely on all that experience to catch that next wave to make that next decision to if i get caught inside in the impact zone and a giant wave's coming i have all that experience to rely on to 
you know, I could go back to my training, go back to all of my experience to be able to, to be able to survive through that, through that situation. And, um, but I think one of the things that really, um, affects my mindset in really big waves is I really enjoy the fact that it separates the men from the boys. I love it when the waves are really giant that a lot of people don't want anything to do with it. And then a lot of times when the waves are really giant and if there's 20 people in the lineup and a really giant one comes, there might, out of those 20 people, there might only be like two or three people who actually want to want that wave. And, and so to be one of those two or three people, you just, you feel like you're part of this elite club. And then that is really, um, you know, there's, there's very few people that can get in that mindset in those kind of extreme conditions. And, um, that is really, really addicting. Yeah. And it motivates you. I mean, yeah. I, I could tell, I mean, and, and but you, you talked about something, you know, falling back on your previous experiences and we talk about this idea of kind of like earned confidence through a lot of reps, you know, and you've been s surfing for, you know, thir 30, 40 years mm -hmm. to get to the point where you now feel so comfortable in these waves or at least more comfortable. Um, how has that process developed over the years? Because did it go from like 40 foot wave to 45 to 50? Or then did you start seeking out big waves and you had to travel? And how did you kind of mentally prepare yourself through training to make those next jumps? And then is a 50 foot wave a big difference compared to a 60 foot? Or is it kind of get to a point where it's how does that work? I don't know what that's like. Yeah, that's a those are those are really good questions and hard to answer. I mean, when I when I when I decided to quit the tour and really focus on big waves, I really started getting into my training a lot more. When I was competing full time, I was going to the gym all the time and trying to stay fit and bring. I used to bring water weights on the on the on the road with me. Have you ever seen those? Yeah, yeah, of course. They're like things you, yeah, you fill up you with fill water, water, like yeah, little, dumbbells. little dumbbells. Yeah, and I would run and I would do my workouts and stuff, and I was getting really into it and. But, and I was, that was just like to maintain fitness while I was competing, to get in the right mindset to compete, to, to feel like I had put in the work. But once I started really pursuing really big giant waves, it's a really, it really was a matter of survival. It's life and death. Every single big session, you're putting your life on the line, pure and simple. So I felt like I needed to up my game and really start working out really hard. And, and, um, and that's what enabled me to have the right mindset when the waves are giant, to feel like I put in the work that I was physically fit, that got me mentally ready. So that's when I found CrossFit. That's when I really started focusing on, on being at the at a top physical condition because that's that really put me in the right mindset. When the waves got really giant, I felt like if I was really physically fit that I was going to survive. So that's a natural, really beautiful segue to fitness. You know, we like to think that for most people listening, fitness shouldn't inhibit like their daily lives, right? They shouldn't have to worry about getting up out of the chair, picking up their kids, but fitness for you is a huge component of staying safe. And yeah. you say on the road, you're using these weights, but how about when the wave, how have you developed your skill set from a mental fitness? What I mean by that is when the wave takes you down and I imagine you're 10, 15, 20 feet underwater yeah. and you're getting tumbled, how do you stay calm? Because I know that helps with obviously your breath use, yeah. right? What What's... What are some skills you've developed in that sense, or is it just through repetition? It's through putting yourself in really uncomfortable situations, um, and w whether that be in actual situations in the water. But I've done a lot of um, like like wipeout simulation training. So like I'll go to a pool with someone who's like a breath specialist, breath holding specialist, and we'll do like um, like for example, just just the other day, me and. Kelly Slater, we did like this, this training in a pool who's with this guy, Mark Visser, who's really, really good. He's, he's an Australian guy, but he, he works with Navy SEALs in, in Virginia and, and, and takes them through all these breath holding scenarios. But we, we were doing a lot of different things, but we would do this thing where we go underwater, hold our breath for 20 seconds, and then swim underwater across the length of the pool with as few strokes as possible right. to try and just stay calm. And then we got to the other side and we had to stay underwater for like the first set was like 20 seconds. The second set was like 30 seconds and we worked our way all the way up to a minute. So you go underwater for like 20 seconds, go across the whole length of a, a, a long pool right. as slow as you possibly can. And then at, at the other side, you had to sit there for a minute underwater. And it's very uncomfortable to do that. You're, you're starting to have the contractions you know, even halfway across the pool, sometimes you're having contractions and then knowing that you have to stay underwater for a minute once you get to the other side of the pool. So just putting yourself through that situation Then we're doing simulation scenarios where we get to the end of the pool 
and then you had to come up and take one breath real quick and then grab out me. and in and then Kelly would grab me, flip me underwater and and basically simulate a heavy wipeout, getting thrown around underwater and then you he would make me come up, breathe as quick as I could, out in, back down, out in, back down. So underwater for like 20 30 seconds, out in, back down, 20 30 seconds, out in, back down, 30 and like to the point where after the training session I was nauseous for like 3 or 4 hours. Um and but knowing that you're able to hold your breath under that stress over and over and over, when the shit hits the fan and you're out at Jaws on Maui or at Mavericks in Half Moon Bay or at Nazare in Portugal and Europe on a big swell and you get taken underwater by that wave, you're not just hoping that you can hold your breath for a long time under stress. You know. You you know. And when you know, then you don't panic. That's the, the, the problem with the, the, the way that people die underwater is they panic. And when you panic, your heart rate goes up. When your heart rate goes up, you use all your breath super fast. It's like putting your foot on the floor on the, on the, on the gas. It just burns all your gas instantly. Um, so if you can keep your heart rate down by not panicking, if you can stay calm, you can hold your breath for much longer. So if you know, hey, look, it, under, under stress, under, with a high heart rate, I can hold my breath for a minute and 45 seconds. Um, then I know that I can, I can survive pretty much any wipeout. Right. Because I can hold my breath for a minute and 45 seconds with a high heart rate. And you can, you can wait until the next set or whatever. Yeah. I think that's super fascinating. I think just hearing you say that, I hope people understand like that mindset. Like you're, you're doing everything you can outside the water in controlled settings, the things that you control yeah. to help you when things that you're, are outside of your control. And out there, it's life and death situation. And yeah. Now, how well does that simulate I've never <laughs> been on an 80 foot wave, 60 foot wave that crushes you. But how well does that, uh, what does it feel like when you're on like a 50, 40, 30 foot wave even, and you kind of fall from the top and you just hit the bottom? I mean, is it like hitting, I mean, what does that feel like? And how do you, in the air, what are you telling yourself? What are you preparing yourself for? So that when you do get into the water, you could stay calm to your point and, and, and go back to your training. Yeah, I mean, it, it does feel like a car crash. And it, it feels like a car crash you know is about to happen, <laughs> which sucks. With an airbag time. or no it airbag? It sucks. <laughs> and, and I actually, just like a couple of weeks ago, I was in an event at Jaws, which is a, a really big wave spot on the north side of Maui. And I caught this wave that as soon as I got to my feet, I knew I was going to fall. It just, the wave changed shape and it just got all this bump and chop and wind coming up the face. I just knew there was an unrideable wave. And so I knew that I was about to hold my breath for a very long time. I knew that I was about to get my butt kicked. I knew it was going to be very, very uncomfortable. So I just went back to the training. As soon as I got to my feet and realized I was going to fall for sure, even though I hadn't f even fallen yet, I just st already started doing my breath. I started doing my breath and getting ready and getting my mind mental mindset to be held underwater for a very long time. And so when it actually happened, I already knew it was going to happen. And so I just, I just kept repeating to myself, go back to my training, go back to my training, go back to my training. This is just like a simulation. And so I've done that a lot. And so it just helps keep, keep me calm in the moment, you know, and just having that right mindset. Um, it's everything. It really is. Wow. Well, to, to, to wrap up on kind of like the, the, the big wave conversation, you know, we talk about how even at Pipeline right now, it's a natural occurrence, right? Um, this is, nature is is a factor here, and which is one of the reasons why I think it's been challenging for you when you're at the, when you're surfing, is because there's so many different factors that are outside your control that can make a difference between someone making the podium or not, right? That, that's, that's tough, yeah. I imagine, as a surfer. Now, when you are getting ready for a big wave, or any wave for that matter, have you seen your ability to overcome adversity on the wave help you outside the ocean. And what I mean by that is pivoting now to your family a little bit. When you go and you're at Jaws and you hit this wave and you know you're about to get messed up, you didn't know that before the wave took you, but you had to overcome it and work it through. Given that nature is so unpredictable, have you developed a set of skills in the water that you feel like have translated to your family or your life outside the water? Yeah, that's a pretty hard question to answer. Um, you know, the surfing big waves is so extreme that I feel like almost nothing else in my life has that intensity. Thank God. Yeah. So I don't want that. Right. I don't want that intensity in like everyday life. You know, I have two kids and that's very intense, you know, as a father, like having children and, you know, n like navigating that and trying to stay sane and keep your marriage going. I have an awesome wife and, um, but I travel tons and so I'm gone all the time. So, um, you know, just like navigating real life, like 
being a dad, being a husband, trying to make a living, trying to stay relevant in my sport. Um, there's a lot going on. So just a matter of like trying to keep the right mindset, I guess, is, is, um, is definitely something that I've, I've brought from my experience in the sport of surfing and surfing big waves. So w when did you meet your wife? When did you guys get married? I met my wife, um, the year that I qualified for the world tour when I was, when I was 19 or 20. And then you guys have been together ever since? We took a three-year break in between. We dated for five years, took a three-year break, and then we got married, and we've been married ever since. We've wow. married for like 18 years. Very cool. And so you have two kids. You have a wife. You have a, I like to say that you, have a, you, you do have a business. You make, you know, you're, you're providing for your family through surfing and, and being this ambassador you are, which I think is exceptional. You pioneered this whole new thing where you're not on the tour, but you're still able to make an impact and that's why sponsors want to be a part of what you're doing i mean you're you're announcing for the for this event right you're yeah. broadcasting that's that's awesome that you've stayed in the game for this many years and still stayed so relevant it's super cool so how has that been challenging having two kids trying to maintain a good marriage and still trying to be relevant in a sport that continues to evolve how have you tried to balance those different things in your life oh, what, what tactics is there anything <laughs> is there any like I'm not going to, I'm going to use this word, any hack, any, anything that you do to really try and elevate each one of those things? I don't, yeah. I mean, for sure. I mean, I, I, f I feel like you just like 90% of it is just showing up, whether it's in like business or being a dad or, or being a husband or, or, you know, like if, 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 if you don't, it's, so much of it is just effort. Like being a good dad. I, I have a lot of friends who are like, man, I, you know, my wife's pregnant my first kid, you know, I feel like you're a good dad. What, what's you know, your what, advice? what's your yeah. advice? Yeah. Show up, go to the games, be there for the birth, be there as much as you can. Just be there for your kids. It's not that hard. If you're there for your children and they're like physically, mentally, you're going to be a good dad. You know, if you got a job and you're really there, you're present, you're really, really there you're probably going to do a really great job at work. Wouldn't you say so? Uh, absolutely. And I, I feel like that's just my mindset is just like really showing up and, and really being present, whether it's me, you know, paddling out to really big waves or being in the commentary booth doing webcasts or raising my kids or being there for my wife as a, as a family man. Um, I just try and show up. I try and, and be there a hundred percent and try and wear those hats. It, it's difficult. It's like a juggling act. Sometimes there's a lot going on in my life. Um, with everything, but just trying to try, just trying to be there, be present. Yeah, I, I, we're we're yeah, it's we're really speaking the same language, you know, like, but yeah, I mean, I t I talk about this idea of kind of looking at each area, like you say, showing up. I say, kind of am wrapping with my kids, you know, like trying to get as many reps in as mm -hmm. I can while I'm while I'm there and being present. It's really cool. So to kind of finish off the the conversation, I think it's I think what you've done is super super fascinating. And where do you think this whole like discomfort being focused? I mean, do you attest a lot of this? Like growing up was, was your relationship? Like, did your parents influence this? Did they support you on this kind of, did they give you this mindset or how did you develop this awareness to, to show up? Yeah, I think I probably get it from my mom. My mom is extremely disciplined. She just does not make excuses. She's just, that's just not in her vocabulary. She's not an excuse person. And so, you know, what I, I kind of came from a broken family. My parents got divorced when I was about 13 and my mom had two jobs. Pay, you know, she, she, she got a loan from the bank to build a house. She paid off her own mortgage yeah. by herself with no help. And I just looked at that and was really inspired. And, um, so I just came from this background of like, shit, my mom is a badass. Right. She doesn't make any excuses. She did it all herself. And it's just sheer discipline. She never was late for work. She never took a sick day. She just showed up all the time. And I feel like a lot of that, a, a lot of that like discipline, I've, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very, I, I'm, there's a lot of things that I'm not, but I'm a very disciplined person. And I think I got all of that from my mom. And that's probably 90% of my success in life. Wow. Very good. Well, hey, Shane, I really appreciate you taking the time, especially while you're out here um, at Pipeline. I, um, where can people find out more about you? Because there's there are other layers to your life that we could dive into at another time, um, such as hunting. I know that's a, a huge passion of yours. Um, but can you tell people where where can they find you and um, find out more about you? Yeah, um, I, I don't know really. Um, I mean, uh, social media. I'm I don't I really the only one I do is um, Instagram. It's my name, Shane Dorian, 
and um, I'm easy to find on there. And um, and then if you want to hear hear more, um, I guess I've done a couple of Joe Rogan yep. podcasts um, on there, so that you can. Listen and you have to an those. incredible video on YouTube of you at Jaws, mm. right? I mean, well, you have incredible videos all over YouTube, but that w the one video that pops up right when you're looking up your name on YouTube is in, is absolutely fascinating for anybody who wants to get extremely motivated. I mean, that thing was just incredible to watch. Thank you. And the feeling, the the look, looking at you when you came out of it, is like a feeling that I bet you you'll remember forever. I think that's really really cool. Yeah, no, there's no doubt. I mean, there's the 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 video you're talking about. That wave was probably the one of the best waves of my life. And and it's surfing. It's in surfing. There's like these little tiny fleeting moments that last only as long as that one wave, and they they might come only once in your whole life that you ride the perfect wave perfectly. It's very very unusual for that to happen because you're dealing with Mother Nature. Like for me, on that day, I'd been waiting a decade for that day to happen, literally. I mean, it just doesn't happen. So the the day was right. I was feeling good. I was feeling healthy. I had the right equipment. I had the right board. I didn't have a cold, no earache. I didn't didn't have a sore shoulder. Like everything was in place. Like it was like a perfect storm of everything. Kind of all the boxes were ticked. And then the waves were epic. And then I was actually in the right spot when that particular wave came in. And then I had the 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 right mindset to turn around and go on that wave. And then I wrote it perfectly. So that's a lot of things that have to happen for that wave. So that's why at the end of that wave, you can see it on my oh, face. Yeah. I'm like, holy moly, like that's like, that won't bliss. happen for a long, long time, if ever. And so that's a really unique thing about surfing is you get these moments that are just like magic. It's crazy. Well, guys, check out more about Shane Dorian. Check him out on uh, IG. I am, um, I'm fascinated with you as a father, as a pioneer in your sport, and uh, obviously for what you're doing. It takes a whole incredible mindset to be able to do it, and uh, just want to thank you for your time. Thanks, Jason, for having me on the show. Uh, all right, guys. Yeah, well, have cool. a great day. <laughs> <laughs> it's real. All right, on, man. Thank you. Yeah.